Okay, remember, as you show videos in here, those may pop up again. You may see that down the road, okay? It makes that possible if all this is posted online on the YouTube channel. I see there's been a few views on there, but that chances are that might be the individuals who are also in Spanish at this time. So, and it's in general, big picture, big picture question. Okay. So, as you can see, we'll be watching something about animal survival, and what that means is that it might deal with something about maybe what the Golgi apparatus or the endoplasmic reticulum is. Something that really, really simple. If you're not paying attention. Something you might want to work on. I don't want to say your fault. We are all human, and it is easy to uh, to make that mistake. But just like last year, like I tell the freshman this year, when it comes to mistakes, what are, what two things do we want to do with those? Yeah. To learn from them and not repeat them. Right? Okay. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this information here, and we will move on with what we'll call it inside animals. Okay, this is where we left off with, correct? Okay. So, write these down. Write these down. Yes, on high school. Those so freshmen as well. You feel like you should be sophomores? I wish I was a senior. Okay. Ready to make all your other choices? Yep. And they're all going to be ready? Yep. Oh. I would have thought the answer would be no. Heck, I still made many mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad there's people out there smarter than us. Okay. So. As we move on, okay, all cells are going to have these three parts in common. Okay, one of them, and C, I like to refer to the top one as called the gatekeeper. Okay, and we'll explain why that is in just a moment. Okay, So why have all this fluid inside the entire cell? There's a reason for it, I would like to think. And when you think about your own human body, it's mainly composed of what? Mainly composed of water. That's right. So all this water has come from somewhere. And what can happen, all right, is Let's say, for instance, this this new show on ABC or NBC, I can't remember what it is, it's called Castaways. Anyone seen or maybe they, it's a new series, so maybe you even watch it. Yes? No? Okay. But with that, if you were uh, actually stranded on a, I want to say desert, I almost said desert island, but an island in the middle of the seas or ocean, okay? One of the things you might, you could think about or maybe I've heard before is, oh my, there's water, water all around, but not a drop to drink. So why would that be? Okay, why is, yeah, you're right. So why is that a problem? It's gonna, for one, if you drink that, it's gonna make you probably even more thirsty but there's even a bigger problem that eventually is going to happen later on. 
Because what can happen is if you get really or extremely dehydrated, one of the first signs that could happen or, or uh, make his presence is uh, hallucinating or having hallucinating or hallucinations. And what that means is you're becoming so dehydrated that you're not getting enough water to, to continue all the metabolic processes in, in your body. Okay? And eventually, to try to even out the salt water and the water inside your body, you want that to be an equilibrium like this. So you have all of this water inside your body, and there's about this much salt in there. Now all of a sudden you're drinking all of this sea, sea water. The amount of salt in your body starts to go up. But well, what's going to happen to this level to try to balance it out? It's going to start to go down. Okay? So when that happens, it can surpass that and pull out so much that people become dehydrated and they start to become uh, hallucinogenic. And eventually, they just uh, pass away or they're not made of it because their cells have become so small to try to uh, stabilize that salt content in their body that the cells just shrivel up and start to die. Eventually, what can happen is it reaches a critical level that can no longer support life. And that's rather unfortunate, but uh, that's essentially what, what would happen. And then I just want to talk briefly about the nucleus, and I'll give you an example of that important part we call the gatekeeper. We won't talk about this right here. We just want to move on, or excuse me, stop where we have the basic part of the cell. So there are three. What are the three basic parts? Nucleus is one. Sorry, what? The plasma membrane, that's two. And the Oh, that's one of the uh, small uh, organelles. So here's the plasma membrane and the nucleus, and then the cytoplasm is the third one. Okay, so that's what we're referring to right here, the cytoplasm. Does everyone have this information that wants it? Okay, so one of the aspects that um, uh, now President Trump is trying to deal with the opioid epidemic. What does that mean? What are opioids, do you think? Now, a lot of them are painkillers, and some of them are illegal drugs as well. So, when that gets into somebody's system, whoever may be taking some of these opioids, is that amount of drug going through the system, is it ever going to stop? Well, yes, it will eventually, but does anyone know this treatment that starts with the letter N? NAR something. I thought I heard it. Nope, that's what all these are, is narcotics. Ever heard of Narcan? Okay, and what that means is inside your cells, okay, you have all of these receptor sites. This is your plasma membrane in between here. Okay, this is your plasma membrane. And that's why we call it the gatekeeper. It's got all of these receptor sites on there. They're saying, okay, we'll let, we'll let this substance in, we'll let this substance out. But this hallucinogenic drug will continue to come in because it's got the receptor sites for these cells, but what Narcan does, 
okay, where these receptor sites are located, it blocks them. And when it blocks that receptor site, it starts to slow down that process of whatever that opioid is. It could be LSD, it could be heroin, it could be cocaine, it could be fentanyl, any one of those, it slows that process down. And that's why your plasma membrane is so important because it's guiding what should be coming in and what should not be coming in. But unfortunately, what happens is uh, throughout the course of Mother Nature evolution, some of these have developed the same type of receptor sites to come in and out. One of the biggest ones, and uh, it might be old news for yourselves, is, is also with viruses as well. So, for instance, when we get to that part uh, next semester, I, always, uh, I think students always laugh when you say, Mr. Hammer, you're such a virus. reason we say that is I've got the keys to that door. So the receptor sites on those cells are specific to this key. So I'm the one that's supposed to be coming in out of here. Well, you people too, but I mean if the door is locked. If our gatekeeper or plasma membrane is locked, well then I should be the only one that has the key. But does Mr. Hammer have the key? So do we want him in here? No. No, we don't want him in here. That's why we call him a virus. He's got the same type of, let's say, uh, chemical makeup that viruses do that actually come in and alter that cell's uh, genetic material. What do they do? Start producing more cells. So it's just an innocent way of calling Mr. Cameron. Anyway, just a little bit of uh, information pertaining to what we call uh, the plasma membrane. Okay. Yeah. you guess is this guy? No. Well, the whole thing is the cell. Membrane. Cell membrane. Plasma membrane. Okay. What do you suppose this red material is all throughout the cell? Cytoplasm. And that big guy moving. Those are probably ERs and uh, that one looks like a mitochondria. Danger. All she can do is try again until she succeeds or succumbs. It's the same for all animals. The need to eat makes every day a fight for life. The differences are only in the animals themselves, their strategies and their settings. In the sky, there's no place for a stalking predator to hide. So for the element of surprise, the peregrine falcon has to resort to sheer speed. 
in a dive. It's the fastest bird in the world. So fast, it's breathtaking. It stalks by flying high and relying on eyes that are as good as telescopes. The fat, slow-looking pigeon might seem to be doomed, but it evolved as peregrines evolved and is equipped to watch for them. Eyes on the side of its head enable the pigeon to forage for seed and scan the sky at the same time. It spies the peregrine. Continuing meeting tomorrow in Miss Paulson's room at 8 10. This is for 8 through 12th grade. Thank you. It becomes a racer. Life wakes up again. 
when there was nothing to eat, this bear ate nothing. It managed to do that by slumbering for five months, getting by on its store fat. And now that the snow is melting, if there will be something to eat, the bear will eat whatever there is. The challenge is finding the opportunities. For this mother, it's a challenge multiplied by three. For the next three years, these cubs, born during the empty winter, will live or die according to her food-finding ability. The ability to find up to 90 pounds of food every day. The air is heavy with clues, but will the bear find them? As the snow melts, a new world of colorful scents and smells is awakening. frozen deer carcass thawing in the snow. Her nose, one of the most sensitive in the animal kingdom, is built to find it. As she inhales, she catches a mass of odor molecules. They pass through tightly scrolled bones covered in soft, wet tissue. These molecules are warmed and poisoned. And trying to attach the smell receptors packed on the tissue surface. Each receptor is tuned to specific molecules. The right ones trigger the receptors to fire, and the bear's brain separates and deciphers the signals. She's caught the scent of the deer. Even though the molecule has traveled nearly two miles before it reached her nose. Some of the best opportunities in the early spring are the animals that didn't make it through the winter. The only question is, will there be enough opportunities to get a mother and her cubs through to next winter? In the forest in India, there's food everywhere all year round. This is the kind of place where specialists live. And the tiger specializes in deer. Her tools are a carnivore's teeth equipped with long stabbing canines and slicing carnassials. Even so, only one in ten hunts succeeds. Because the deer are so highly strung, so tiger sensitive. It's a nervous existence. A herbivore's problem is that the tough grass they eat, plentiful as it is, isn't very nutritious. That means when they're out in the open, they have to eat a lot and eat it quickly. Fear of the tiger doesn't even give them time to digest. Their broad, flat molars are perfectly adapted to grind the grass down, but they will digest it later, safe from the tiger's threat. Now they must be alert and pool their eyes and ears by staying together in the herd. The tiger 